All, all systems are go. Welcome, everybody, to day two of Generation Analog. I'm Dr. Evan Torner, co-editor of Analog uh, Game Studies and uh, co-organizer of this conference, along with um, uh, many other people, including my fellow editors at, at Analog Game Studies, Shelly Jones and uh, Aaron Trammell, and uh, Micha Borges uh, from uh, Asthma Day Gaming Lab in France. And a, a non, a Leah Martinez and a number, uh, Gabriel Faust, a number of other um, uh, Asthma Day Gaming Lab employees. Uh, just so we can keep the time, I'm going to dive right into the content of the panel. Uh, this is panel number five um, decolonizing uh, role playing games, specifically decolonizing analog role playing games. Uh, and the uh, all star panel here are going to be looking at sort of a uh, at a cross section of between uh, play community diversity, um, uh, play practices, mechanics, game mechanics, and representation in games. And I'm ex excited to see um, what what this sort of research is uh, is offering, not only for um, you know reframing our theoretical conceptions of role playing games, but also very again practical solutions on what we can do to further this process along of decolonization. So our first uh, panelists um, are, are uh, Kate Ringland and uh, Annie Forsman Adams. And Kate Ringland, uh, I can uh, say their biography and, and then um, uh, she, will, she will then present. Uh, Kate Ringland is an assistant professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She received her PhD in informatics from the University of California, Irvine. Her areas of interest include human, human computer interaction, game studies, and critical disability studies. She is interested in understanding how disabled individuals leverage so social media and game spaces as access in their online and offline interactions. And uh, you can find them at kateringland.com. Again, uh, a, a moment of procedure. Um, each presentation will be 15 minutes. Uh, please um, put your questions, I guess, in the chat um, because we don't have a QA. and a And also, um, I will intervene at, on, at, and the fit when the 15 minute mark is over with the presenters so that we have plenty of time for discussion of all the papers at the end. And I'll try to keep track of the questions as they come. And at this point now, Kate, your 15 minutes starts. I, they didn't start earlier. So now it starts. I thank you so much for, for presenting. If you'd like to, you can share your screen uh, to present. Great. And I actually, we just recorded a video. So hopefully I can get this to work. Um, because Annie is on the res and has spotty internet, so which is possibly why she's not here yet. Um, share sound. So hopefully everyone is seeing my PL. And I want to move just so I can see it. Okay. And let me know if um, if you can't if I need to adjust the sound. Will do. We'll be presenting healing through story using games to process trauma in indigenous communities. Hi everybody. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. My name is Annie Forsman Adams, and I am a member of the Suquamish tribe here on the beautiful Salish Sea in Washington State. I have been a long time volume up, please working with victims of crime throughout the state and in indigenous communities and I currently work in public policy as well as academically I'm a graduate student at Seattle University where I study criminal justice and I specifically study a homicide and indigenous women uh, and media coverage. I'm I have my volume at max so I'm not sure at, at this point I, I'm relying on the subtitles but I, I'm I, I'm happy they're subtitles. <laughs> Okay. Um, sorry, one second. No, there's a reason I made this video a little shorter than 15 minutes. Um, I'm not sure how else I have my sound at max. So I'm not really sure how else to get the sound up. Yeah, at this point, I think I think you can play the video with the subtitles, and and we will that, that okay. Will be, yeah, that will be the way we will do it. But that, but no harm done. I, we can barely hear it, but we can see the subtitles. My name is Kate Ringland, and I am an assistant professor in the Department of Computational Media at University of California, Santa Cruz. 
in my research, I study playful community spaces, and I am particularly interested in how marginalized groups or marginalized subgroups of communities use these playful spaces as a platform for getting support and care. And so that's a little bit of my interest coming into this project. And we're really excited to talk to you about this project today. Um, the idea of this project really came out of a need to provide my not only my indigenous relatives but also the indigenous victims that I've worked with throughout my career with a way to understand and process their trauma in ways that felt familiar to them both um, in a contemporary sense and a traditional sense so it's really exciting to look at how we can take the ideas and research and thought around play and the benefits of play and meld that together with indigenous values and indigenous knowledge and see how much of that really lines up. So we're excited to talk to you about that today. I want to start by just acknowledging the land that I'm on. Uh, I live on the Port Madison Indian Reservation on the sacred land of my people and in virtual spaces, it can be a little bit difficult to try and acknowledge where everybody is. So I really hope that you take some time to research your, the land that you live on, the people that are indigenous to that land, and the social and political things they are doing in your community and how you can support them. So I just want to start by offering a word to you, Seattle. Every part of this soil is sacred in the estimation of my people. Every hillside, every valley, every plain and grove has been hollowed by some sad or happy event in the days long vanished. The land we currently gather on and the land I call home is the ancestral territory of the Suquamish people. For thousands of years, fishermen, carvers, artisans, activists, leaders, and healers have lived in harmony with this land and the water in what we now know as Washington Salish Sea. The people of this land carry the message and teachings of their ancestors every day and vow to protect it for future generations. The history of indigenous people here and throughout the United States have been, has been marked with unspeakable violence and tragedy. The collective resilience, unending bravery, and commitment to survival has carried many of us through. We continue to do the hard work in pursuit of sovereignty and justice to honor these ancestors. So let me just jump right into what we want to share with you today and i want to start by just talking a little bit about the background of indigenous people and what kind of indigenous societies looked like prior to colonization i want to make a really firm point here that it is very difficult to talk about indigenous communities in broad strokes although for the sake of brevity, that's uh, ultimately what we're going to do today. It's important to remember that even within the state or even within the region, indigenous communities are diverse. They're very diverse and practices, traditions, customs, and beliefs differ from family to family, from nation to nation, from community to community, from community to community, and even sometimes from person to person. And so it's always important to honor that and to really spend time learning about the indigenous community that you're working with to make sure that you do not transpose any other beliefs that may or may not be appropriate and to just really respect that a lot of communities may be redefining or rediscovering some of their ancestral practices their ancestral knowledge and beliefs that has been lost through a pattern of colonization and oppression and um, just to give indigenous communities space to be able to explore that so I want to give just kind of a broad overview of, from a Coast Salish perspective about what indigenous communities looked like prior to colonization. And there is a lot of things in popular culture that we get right about this and some things that we just don't get right. And what we really want to focus on is this idea that there was no centralized power or authority structure. So people really relied on each other. They relied on the knowledge and values that could be shared peer to peer as a way of learning things about the world. And because it was so important to learn these things from peer to peer, the traditional value systems looked much different than Western value systems today, and even the value systems of some contemporary indigenous communities. So <clears throat> there were much more expansive definitions about gender, and there were much looser and more fluid gender roles in communities, and people were not viewed as 
property or being able to be owned by either another person or by a system or by anything like that. But really what we focused on for this project were these values of one communal living and those peer to peer exchange networks and the value of oral history and the use of language and storytelling and talking and spending time together as a way of learning not only how to exist in the world but how to exist as a person in the community and how values and cultural teachings were instilled that was very important to tribal communities it continues to be really important to tribal communities and so it really is this role of storytelling that was used to pass along important messages to teach important lessons and to pass on cultural teachings. So as the community started to be broken down and these venues and, and practices of storytelling became less and less frequent, a lot of this cultural connection was lost amongst indigenous people. And, um, but there's been a real resurgence to bring back traditional ways of storytelling and to keep those traditional stories alive throughout tribal communities everywhere. And um, I think that this project is really an additional effort to be able to do that and to be able to honor those stories in a way that that creates um, a living memory for indigenous people who are still experiencing the effects of the intergenerational trauma. Indigenous people have experienced his traumatic events almost since the moment settlers and colonizers stepped foot on um, what is now the United States. We can't really talk about all of them in this venue, but it is really important to understand them and to do some research on them and to understand the not just the damage that war and disease and famine brought when the when westward expansion started to really ramp up, but to also understand the policies that came after that as a way of creating more inequity and more trauma throughout communities and how it continues to today. So, you know, we see what's going on with Standing Rock and Line 3 and the fishing wars in Canada. And we, and we see that the same type of colonial violence is being used today to further degrade Indigenous communities throughout the country. So ultimately what happens is that indigenous people start almost from the moment that white European settlers um, start to, to colonize the land, they experience basically ongoing intergenerational trauma with each generation kind of experiencing a new widespread traumatic event. And it creates a culture of trauma responses because in some ways those trauma responses become the new cultural teachings because they are no longer replaced by positive, affirming, and appropriate cultural teaching. And this causes high levels of distress and anxiety within the community. It also creates a vulnerability for uh, victimization and other type of social problems and um, creates a, a fear of, of kind of never ending trauma. Not only that, but it disrupts the way that indigenous communities can relate to each other and disrupts that very important peer to peer exchange network that was so important during traditional life. The trauma can be transmitted interpersonally through the like secondary experiences of telling the stories of the traumatic event. So I experienced this a lot. I grew up with a family who was very involved politically and I heard stories of my um, dad who was a fisherman and he would be assaulted by federal agents during the fishing wars and things like that. And so those become part of my living memory. And that happens with indigenous people all over the place. And then it also happens on a social level because we have lost traditional teachings and ways of life and those repl are replaced by maladaptive teachings and maladaptive coping mechanisms. So I feel like with this crowd, I don't need to offer too much in terms of background about play and games. Uh, what I would like to say here is that um, there's been lots of scholarship on how playful spaces and game spaces are often a way for communities to come together to form relationships, for people to bond with one another. Games and play are a great place to relax, to restore, and even 
come at things like difficult topics in order to be able to discuss them. We know that games are a great space for learning. There's a whole plethora of, you know, educational learning uh, scholarship for games. It's a place for gaining skills and um, learning new things and gaining new perspectives. So our aim with this project was to kind of take all of that wonderful play and game scholarship in addition to thinking about some of the kind of contexts and, and ideas from Western medicine in terms of things like, say, art therapy or play therapy, and take all of that and see how, what might happen if we applied a decolonized lens and thinking about our space here in terms of trauma and the indigenous context. So ultimately what I think we are trying to do with this, this project and with this game is to be able to identify some of those traditional teachings that are having a resurgence and that are being brought back to life by indigenous communities here in the Pacific Northwest and to be able to apply those to what we know about the importance of play and respite and things like that as well as provide a way for indigenous people to be able to relate to each other in ways that feel familiar and it is important to really acknowledge that even in all indigenous people have been traumatized whether they have been traumatized within their lifetime or within the lifetime of their ancestors and they carry that trauma with them and what we're really looking to do is create a tool to alleviate some of those trauma responses, to alleviate some of the burden and, hev and heaviness of carrying that trauma, but to also create a tool that rejects the idea that Western knowledge and Western medicine is the only way that, it, that we can do this, but that rather looking to cultural knowledge as a way of informing current day practices in a way that I think can be beneficial to everyone, not just indigenous communities, but I really firmly believe that indigenous knowledge benefits all of us. If we can find a way to make it so that it is accessible to everyone, I think we create a better world. And I think that we create better opportunity for people to process their trauma in a way that helps everyone and ultimately helps themselves. So with that, I'm really hoping that folks really kind of take away some new ideas about what it means to work in a decolonized way and to think about some of the indigenous contexts that we talked about today. And then we, of course, we're happy to, during the Q&A and on Discord, take any questions and kind of talk about our ideas further as we keep developing them. Feel free to reach out to us on Twitter or through email as well. Thank you. All right, and that's us. Sorry about the sound. I um, I will also upload this to YouTube so that people can um, check it out if they want to actually hear it. <laughs> all right, thank you so much, Kate, and and I appreciate uh, all of your efforts to 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 get the audio up, but that all of your efforts also to make the the video so that you and Annie could both be digitally present in this way. I appreciate it, um, and. So we, we are moving on to our next speaker, who is Stephen Daschle. Um, Stephen, uh, I would say Dr. Stephen Daschle. Stephen Daschle, PhD, is a postdoctoral fellow at American University in Washington, D.C., jointly appointed to the Department of Sociology and the Game Center. His research centers on the sociology of language, specifically discourse patterns and narratives surrounding male-dominated subcultures and publics. Current projects involve tabletop role-playing games, the military, African-American male spaces, and fringe male-only groups. I'd like to welcome Stephen to the space and uh, to present. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> thanks for including my postdoc. Yeah, I've been a postdoc for four whole days. So yeah, this is all still very new to me. Okay, let me hope that this share Oh, you are kidding me. Um, just give me a sec. Why? I tested this. 
It's okay. Day two is the glitch day, and we've decided that, and now it's decided. So you've got a lot of patience for it. <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you. Now, if I can just have all right, you're, five you're all seconds. Good. Oh my gosh. Okay, let's see if it works now. Okay, can you see my screen? Absolutely, it looks beautiful. Wonderful, oh my gosh. Oh, thank you, Lord. Okay. All right, so again, Stephen Daschle, postdoctoral research fellow. My presentation is on Gamer Stores and Guild Doors, narrative analysis of minority gamers' experiences at analog game spaces. Allow me to preface this with, this is research that I am doing at American University. It is research that I'm actually going to be starting, uh, but it is based on the formative research and papers and research that I've done up to this point. So just giving you that um, before I start. That's me. I am a social scientist, I'm a sociologist by trade. Um, as Evan said, sociology of language. I'm a critical realist, so I look at the re repetitive and historical social structures that cause the cultures that we live in. It's important to note that whereas some people study in game studies the games and some people study the players, I actually don't study either. I study the culture of gaming. So gaming culture is really where I'm centered. So I kind of like align myself very much with the work of Mia Consalvo and other individuals, some of which are in this room right now. In terms of this presentation, let me blame the person whose fault this is. It's his fault for two reasons. Number one, uh, this is Aaron's fault because of the fact that in getting into this field and getting into this process, he has been one of my biggest boosters and supporters, and he has been instrumental in a lot of the work that I've been doing, and both in the sense of his work and his papers and his mentoring of me, but also because of the fact that about six months ago, he did a presentation that I sat in on virtually, and he started, I don't even know if you remember this, Aaron, with a picture of a gaming store in his former neighborhood and talking about that from the perspective of formative spaces and like, this is the first place where you game. And that got me thinking in the middle of the process and that led to this, which is the research that I'm going to be presenting right now. So there are some anecdotal beliefs that have been bandied around in game studies. And one thing that my research is going to do is going to challenge some of those. So one thing that I've heard over and over again is every gaming table is different. And the fact is that it's hard to predict what gaming culture looks like because every gaming table is different. It's filled with different people. It's a very post-structuralist argument. The other idea is that diversity and inclusion or DEI are issues in contemporary gaming. So one of the comments that we hear a lot is we need to create more seats at the table and that one of the problems is representation and diversity. And in some senses, I agree, and in some senses, I don't. And I will explain that before um, people start wondering about that. And actual play is the prime suspect of cultural transmission. Now, this is kind of a new thing that's coming up in a lot of papers and um, articles talking about problems in, quote unquote, toxic gaming. And I've seen three or four papers in the last three, five or six months that have basically blamed critical role for passing on this toxic gaming culture. And actual play is getting a lot of hits for passing on this culture where one of the ideas that I put forth is eh, maybe not. So from my perspective as a critical realist, it's not so much the idea of individuals in diversity and inclusion as in bringing people in. It's the fact that to uh, kind of speak towards the last, um, the last major speaker uh, last night, it's erasure of gender and race diversity. There have always been people of color and women at the table. There have always been women and people of color and sexual minorities involved in gaming. However, because of the nature of the gaming culture, there has been an effort to erase them. 
and to make them seem like they are just quote unquote one of the guys to the point that unless they are highlighted, that we don't even recognize the women and the people of color and the sexual minorities that have been involved since the beginning. And part of this I think is intentional and part of this I think is completely unintentional, but it all comes out to being that we suddenly don't see the women that have been involved, the individuals who are black, who are Latino, who are Native American, who are sexual minorities, who have been involved that we've never been told about. The second idea is the concept of transmission of gaming culture. I am not convinced that actual play and critical role is the major source of the transmission of gaming culture. One of the major points that I put forth in some of the papers that I've written before is that Gaming culture has been transmitted in multiple places, such as places like Gen Con and in certain spaces, such as the Paratext. And this relates to some of the work that's in the International Journal of Role Playing. And if you haven't read that, read it now. But there is a paper uh, specifically talking about Paratext and looking at source books and rule books as Paratext. And the power, which I build on in some of my newest research, of these paratexts in transmitting culture, that they are indirectly transmitting gamer culture through the writing. There's also some question about the space of gaming socialization and, and how gaming socialization is formed. I, it's a concept people have talked about, but in far, as far as really conceptualizing what gaming socialization is, that's something that I really want to dig deep into. Then there's meta discourse, which I'll explain on the next slide. And one of my big things is this, there's value in critique of people at the table. So when people say we need more people at the table, that's fine. But my big thing is this, what if the problem isn't the people at the table? What if the problem is the table? And if there is an inherent problem in the culture, culture is made up of people, but from a critical realist point of view, Culture gains its own quote unquote life because it is historically reproduced and changing the culture is much different than simply changing the people. And to that point of erasure of gender and race, that's why I put the Ellison quote from Invisible Man. I just saw it about a week ago and it hit me and it made me completely change the slide because it's like, that's exactly what I'm talking about. What's meta discourse? Meta discourse is discussion and communication that happens at the gaming table. We're not talking about, for example, in role playing games, the degree to which individuals are talking about the game, or it's like <laughs> the classic start. You're in a bar. And it's not that, but what we're talking about is think of all of the concepts and all of the discussion that happens at the gaming table that's not really germane to the game, but really wouldn't occur if the game were not occurring. And so like off topic stories and mentions, insider knowledge, comparisons to history and past instances and pop culture references and stories. I remember when I was coming up um, and playing D&D for the first time as a 12 or 13 year old, I remember being at a gamer table at a comic book store and people telling Monty Python and the Holy Grail uh, jokes and everybody in the table around the table laughing and me saying, what? Because for me, in the 80s, Monty Python and the Holy Grail was not necessarily a part of my cultural lexicon. But I went back to my family and said, hey, what about Monty Python? It would be like, who is that? So it is a recognition that if you are not involved in these pieces of game socialization and game culture and game capital, going right back to Consalvo, then you're at a disadvantage. And meta discourse speaks to a uh, structural cultural history of the game and the group. So being a part of the group and being a part of the understandings of the game, which in the going back to talking about the paratext and the things such as source books, you can only get so much out of that. And recognizing that there's more to get and a question of how do you get that? How do you learn how to participate in meta discourse? How do you exist so you're not just the person sitting there taking it all in? And it's a highly socializing aspect, but it's based on a specific background associated with the male preserve. There are many things that are part of game meta discourse that are very male focused. And whereas we want to think gender socialization recognizes the idea of multiple expressions of 
identity and multiple expressions of gender, one thing I can tell you as a sociologist is this, we socialize in the binary. Things are masculine or feminine. And as such, gaming and the gaming culture is very much socialized in the masculine. Even if people around the table are not themselves identified or recognized men. So what are some of the research questions of the research that I want to do? What's the significance of first gaming spaces, notably gaming stores and comic book stores, in socializing individuals to tabletop role-playing games? What are the obstacles that populations such as women, people of color, and sexual minorities have in understanding gaming norms? I mean, the assumption is you hang out enough and then you get it. Uh, yeah, it took me years. And maybe I was just somewhat slow in the process, but in talking to individuals anecdotally, I get the sense that I was the norm, not necessarily the exception. But this research would at least add some credence to that beyond the, beyond the abstract. Um, how do subaltern populations characterize these first experiences in defining their gamer identities? Are they used as motivators? Are they used as, you know what, screw this, I'm going to create my own game? Or maybe I'm going to look for spaces that have more women or more sexual minorities or more individuals of color. So I want to find that out. And what are the relationship or what do the relationships that exist have with gaming capital, the presentation of self in the gaming world? And I know Sarah Lynn Bowman, if she's on this call, is happy because yes, it's Golfman again. But hey, Goffman can be useful, and the idea of symbolic interactionist performance is definitely useful in dramaturgy. So what am I doing? Grounded theory, as in, I don't know exactly what I'm going to find, but I have a sense that these people are going to tell me something. So grounded theory says I've got this overarching general idea of what I think I'm going to find, but I know I'm going to find some great other stuff. And I have to tell you, as a researcher, I was critical of grounded theory coming in because sociology is not necessarily the biggest fan of grounded theory. But 85% of the research that I now do is grounded theory. And I'm amazed at what I walk out of the field finding. Looking at those emerging codes that come from the research, what are individuals telling me? And doing this in a form of narrative analysis, telling people to tell me a story. So it doesn't feel like an interrogation. And one of the ways that I do this, and this is a format that I uh, determined and I developed throughout the pandemic, is instead of interviewing people, is giving them a list of questions and then having them respond to those in their own words, at their own time, at their own pace, in a, their own recording, at either an audio recording or a video recording, which they release back to me. I want to utilize this on 25 individuals, minorities, sexual minorities, racial minorities, gender identity minorities, whose first gaming experiences were at stores. And use a program known as VoiceThread, and if any of you are educators, you know VoiceThread, for ease and functionality. And luckily, because I'm a postdoc, I've got a little bit of money, so I can give these 25 individuals a $20 gift card incentive. What are the theoretical foundations? Practice theory, I'm a big fan of Pierre Bourdieu and his ideas of capital, gaming capital, specifically tying in the work of Consolvo. If you haven't read Cheating, read it now. And the ideas of symbolic violence. What are the things that are said that are said in passing in these circumstances that actually come off as symbolic violence? Outsider Within, which is Patricia Hill Collins and feminist theory, I am heavily, heavily, heavily influenced by feminist theory and the idea of feminist standpoint. And it leads me to question whether there is indeed a particular gaming standpoint from which uh, the academic world is not looking. Dramaturgy, just explain that. And gaming theory, such as game capital, paratext, male preserves, and meta discourse. I wrote a paper um, for the International Journal of Role Playing, uh, plug number two, um, that is talking about male preserves and looking at gaming as a male preserve. So there is some relevance there. And my paper on meta discourse is actually under review right now. So hopefully it will be published within the next eh, six to seven months. And one of the things I get slammed on a lot in terms of my research well, when I was a younger researcher was, what's the so what? 
And the so what here is understanding the social placement of game stores in the gaming experience. And some of the demonstration of ways in which there is gamer socialization, something again, that we haven't really talked about. And what ways are there to transmit the culture? We know that the source books transmit culture. We know that websites transmit culture. But to what degree do those actual participation sessions in games transmit culture? And impression management. How do people go about forming their gamer self at the table? And what do you hold back? What do you put forward? in order to show yourself as a gamer at the table. How's that different if you're a woman or if you're trans or if you're black or if you're Native American? And the male preserve, because I honestly don't think there is enough done with the male preserve. It's a sociological idea that had its heyday and is not as popular anymore, but I'm bringing it back. Um, the persistence of components in gaming culture, and looking at them from a historical point of view, when people are like, well, why are things not changing? One of the reasons it's not changing is because of a historical persistence of these ideas. And that even if you change the demographics of people, some of these aspects of culture will persist. And the cultural erasure that is masked as inclusivity. And this is a broader argument that would take me about like nine more minutes to explain. And I've really only got three, so let me move on. By plan and timeline, um, IRB submission, it's already written up. And I actually was in a meeting with the director of research uh, this morning at 9 a.m. So this is going to be put forth for IRB approval by the 31st of August. Um, and so by mid-September, I'm sure I'll have IRB approval. They already like the idea. Recruitment and interviews will occur between October and January. Transcription and analysis is February to May. That's a really short period of time to do um, transcription. I like hate or rage like transcription, but I've been told I should just hire a transcriber. Um, and the analysis of the data and the write up and presentation of uh, the data, which is my oh my, just in time for the next time that we do generation analog. But no, 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 it may be presented here, it may be presented someplace else. So just letting people know. If you're interested in either participating or more information or carrying on the discourse beyond this, by all means, contact me. That's my address if you actually want to walk there or go there. I don't know why. That's my email address, easy. It's just my last name at American.edu. Twitter, feel free, but I'm really bad at Twitter. And um, thanks to the presentation yesterday, because I actually have that little thing that if you put your phone up, it'll send you to my academia.edu page, which will show you my publications, plus some of the presentations that I've done, most of them have been with gaming. And that is it. Give a, a round of virtual applause, which you can do in, in, in the Zoom uh, seminar format for, for Steve and Dashiell. And I'm quite, uh, overwhelmed with the, the things that, that are raised by this research, right? You're, you're asking pointed research questions, but actually it's, it's sort of the whole kit and caboodle in the nut, you know, and, and, and I'm questioning my own biography in, the, in this process. Um, I'm going to move on to our uh, next uh, speaker, who would be uh, Cody Wallitzer. And it, so Cody, if you could get your video on and ready to go, I will present your bio. I believe I'm here. People see and hear me. I can see and hear you. All right, right on. And 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 do you have a a, a, um, a presentation you would like to share? Yes, I do. Then 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 I, the the strategy will be you can hit share screen, make sure that works, and I will read your bio. I think we're rocking. Can everybody see this over here? I can. This is great. And again, so super excited to to see this talk. Um, uh, Cody Walitzer is a PhD candidate and visiting professor in communication studies at the University of Denver, where he is the director of debate. His areas of interest include public policy, crime and deviance, coloniality, and the, philosoph and the philosophy of communication. Uh, Cody's research focuses on the ways that canes and sports rhetorically constitute participants and observers, and the way in which people interact with the rules of the game, in quotes. Speaking of games, Cody loves to play Dungeons and Dragons, Magic the Gathering, and too many sports and video games to count. 
Uh, welcome, Cody, and we are glad to have you here and look forward to this. Thanks so much, everyone, for your time. Just a couple of quick uh, housekeeping notes. The first thing is that I do not have the chat open. So if you're trying to get my attention uh, or something like that, you can feel free to use one of the other methods, the reactions or turning on your camera or something, uh, especially if I have an internet connection issue. Um, the second thing is, and you know, I really appreciate your introduction, Evan, when people hear debate and when they hear what I'm about to say, uh, I think it tends to scare people away. Uh, when I say that I disagree with a lot of the things that I've heard at this conference, I promise that I'm not trying to be antagonistic and I don't want you to run away. I find that disagreement to be productive and I would just uh, quickly bracket Kate, Annie and uh, Stephen's presentations there as being things that I don't have uh, those feelings about necessarily right off, off of the bat. Um, I also want to, before I get started, as well as Kate and Annie, uh, give a land acknowledgement on behalf of myself, the University of Denver, and the Department of Communication Studies there. Native tribes, specifically the Cheyenne and the Arapaho, are the original stewards of the land that I am currently presenting on. And if you'd like to learn more about how Native peoples were displaced, were violently displaced from their ancestral homelands, including the space that is now the University of Denver, you can read the John Evans report here. And uh, regrettably, I'm not on the Discord yet. I will be on the Discord after after this. Uh, so I'd be uh, happy to share the full slides with you. You can click that link. You can also just search the John Evans report. And I think this is, this is particularly important to mention, specifically because of the fact that we are giving a panel on decolonizing role-playing games, right? And so thinking about the relationship between where we are and where we work and the work that we're doing is incredibly important. And for me, it's just, it's impossible to do this work and to think through these issues without doing that. All right. As an overview of what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to address the controversy that I study here, the controversy that I analyze over fantasy race and uh, role-playing games and ability scores in Dungeons and Dragons. I'm gonna go over the methodology that I employed for this study, the theoretical framework that I'm trying to extend. I am making a prescriptive argument in some ways here. And then finally, the conclusions that I come to. So let's jump right into thinking about this controversy over race and ability in Dungeons and Dragons. And many of you may remember this article, which was published on the Dungeons and Dragons homepage last year. You can see, uh, maybe you can't see, but very small there under the title, it is dated June 17th, 2020, right? So uh, at about this time last year or a little bit b before that, the concept of fantasy race and ability scores was trending on Twitter. Twitter, The hashtag orcs was uh, trending for a good couple of days there. And just as a brief background, if you're not familiar with what this controversy is or the content of this controversy, Here's a little bit of information. Um, the game Dungeons and Dragons is a fantasy setting that is heavily inspired by the work of such authors as J.R.R. Tolkien. And within the concept of Tolkienian fantasy, there's the idea that somewhat different species of beings, they're sort of humanoids or human-like, coexist, or in the case of orcs, they sort of do not coexist uh, uh, in the world. So rather than there being humans and race being a social construct that exists between those humans, but not a real thing. In the world of Tolkien, Tolkienian fantasy, race is a very real thing, right? It creates uh, ethnic, cultural, and genetic lines between people that are more or less absolute. In the game Dungeons and Dragons, one of the ways that those fantasy races is represented is through player characters. So if you're not familiar again with d and I'm, I'm assuming that some people are, and I have to uh, assume that just in, in the sake of time, but there's sort of a setup where the dungeon master or game master is setting the scene for a cast of characters that are controlled by players. And those players making those characters at the beginning of character creation, literally uh, the first page of chapter one in the fifth edition player's handbook are asked to make a choice about what race they want to play or portray in that fantasy game. Ability scores then are game mechanics which numerically represent that particular character's chance at succeeding at something in that setup, right? So if the dungeon master is setting the scene, they're asking the character to do something. Typically what they ask them to do is to roll a 20-sided dice. And the way that an ability score works is, is going to modify that role. 
So race and ability score in Dungeons and Dragons are linked, leading many to say like, wait a minute, isn't this kind of the way that racists talk about race, that it has these kind of uh, uh, completely impossibly, uh, um, you know, absolute and, uh, you know, boundary defining features between different groups of people? And the answer is yes, that is definitely the way that racists talk about race. So what do we do about that? Well, ultimately, the controversy that I outline and the way that the trajectory of it sort of develops, this article is actually the end to the controversy and in, in the analysis that I provide. And so you might ask, okay, so you're presenting a, a study on a controversy that is over. Why is that? And I, I would just say, uh, two brief things before getting into more of the method or the theoretical framework. First of all, I would say, I don't think this controversy is over. I do think that this, this article represents a clear shift in the trajectory of discourse about race and ability in Dungeons and Dragons. It represents Wizards of the Coast, the publishers of the game, the, the people who are creating the game, uh, taking a public stance for the first time saying, look, we recognize this racist history. Here are the very concrete things that we're going to do about it. So it certainly changes the character of the conversation that's developing around this issue. The second thing that I would say is, even though this represents kind of an end to that controversy in terms of the game changing and the future forward thinking, this paper is not about mechanics. This paper is not about how to fix the game. This paper is about what the game means. That's where rhetorical criticism comes in. So just as a brief visual, let's look at what some ability score uh, uh, literature looks like. This is directly from the Player's Handbook. This is from the popular um, Dungeons & Dragons platform D&D Beyond. And you can see that ability scores exist on a two-point scale. So the 10 to 11 range is considered to be average or neutral. That provides a zero modifier when you roll the dice. So that dice is the analog of your character's ability, your, uh, your character's chance at success at something. And these modifiers change improve or decrease the uh, chance for success. So let's say that I have, you know, a, a, an ability score that is very, very low. Uh, it's going to give me a low chance at success. Now, there are six ability scores, right? Strength, dexterity, constitution, wisdom, intelligence, charisma, all of those things represent ability in a very reductive way in Dungeons and Dragons, right? And that makes sense from a systematic and programmatic standpoint. You need some type of, of way to, to, fully capture the um, you know improvisational abilities of characters and players around the table. But at the same time, you do have this emphasis on how race as a choice impacts that chance of success, right? So the ways in which player choice is constrained is not limited to probability or their imagination. It is also limited to this very rigid social structure that is put into the thematic and lud uh, ludotic uh, uh, parts of the game here. All right. So part of this and part of this journey for me is realizing that my rosy colored glasses of J.R.R. Tolkien's work had to be shattered. And this is a direct quote from a collection of letters, specifically letter 210, in which J.R.R. Tolkien is responding to some uh, uh, pieces of a film or a film script that has been made about Lord of the Rings. And you can see right at the beginning, he's sort of talking about the costumes that are given to orcs. But here's where uh, uh, this becomes really problematic for us. Tolkien says the orcs are definitely stated to be corruptions of the human form seen in elves and men. They are or were squat, broad, flat-nosed, sallow skin with wide mouths and slant eyes. In fact, regarded and repulsive versions, uh, uh, degraded and repulsive versions of the two Europeans' least lovely Mongol types. Um, it literally says Mongoloid on my dad's birth certificate. So when I read this, I was pretty taken aback and I felt as though, uh, you know, I needed to do something. There was a, a lot, a great deal of motivation that came from seeing this. Additionally, it's impossible to divorce this controversy as it has developed over time. I mean, we can kind of trace this controversy since that letter as a trajectory all the way until that Dungeons and Dragons article that I mentioned. But along with that, right, comes the history, uh, the fraught history of racial relations within the United States. And so I mentioned that that article uh, on D&D 
um, on d and homepage was published on June 17th, 2020. Well, what was going on around that time, as we all remember, is the response to the murder of George Floyd. Um, and so we, we have a controversy from a rhetorical standpoint that is not only incredibly intense, but it reflects as a microcosm a lot of what is going on in broader society and a lot of the issues and conversations that people are having are reproduced here. So again, that provides us with a motivation. Another part of my motivation is a piece by James Menez Hodes, which is uh, all about orcs. It's called Orcs, Britons, and the Martial Race Myth. And so what I'm trying to do here is provide an extension to that work. I'm hoping and thinking that many people uh, here have read or interacted with that work by giving it a critical vocabulary, which I believe that it lacks. And I'll get to that critical vocabulary when I get to the theoretical framework here. There are two kinds of, of research questions that we can ask. One, as a rhetorical critic, is a general research question. So I'm interested, as Evan introduced me as, in the question of how do games rhetorically constitute the things which they depict and the people that play them? The specific research question that we can derive from that is how does D&D and the discourse surrounding it constitute the things which it depicts, like orcs, and the people that play the game? So how do these rules then create us as we are uh, conforming to those rules and using them to storytell, create narratives, and all those types of things? In terms of method, as I mentioned, I'm a rhetorical critic. I'm thinking about this through rhetorical criticism, but I'm combining a decolonial philosophy of communication, and in this case, controversy studies with rhetorical criticism. So again, in terms of that general question, I'm going to provide an answer that says, language constructs a great deal of our reality. That's how games rhetorically constitute the things which they depict and the people that play them. It, it is not necessarily overdetermined, but there is a great deal of weight that we can apply to it. In terms of this specific question, then, what I would say is that the language that we use to play D&D affects us outside of D&D. It constructs our reality outside of D&D. And so, Dr. Dasho, you mentioned Irving Goffman, right? He talks about how games are world-building activities, meaning that the, the activity of playing games creates our world, not that we, you know, uh, uh, solely build these smaller worlds, right? So in terms of rhetorical criticism, there are a couple of emergent themes that come from this analysis of this controversy. And really what they do is they reproduce the discourse that we're seeing in Tolkien in a way that I say is important and essential for decolonial work moving forward. The first theme is race as concrete. So this is where we define the orc. And this is where we see that race is no longer a social construction within D&D or within fantasy. It is real. Again, it is mathematical. It is statistical. And again, we see the orc defined as mongoloid. So there is a, uh, a concrete allegory or a concrete uh, uh, metaphorical uh, uh, touchstone for us in the real world as to how race as concrete is being defined. We also get something I'm sure some people here are familiar with, the concept of the evil other as a theme emerging from this analysis of the controversy. And we get the figure of the drow emerging here. So these two case studies kind of orient us to how these themes are manifesting in the discourse. And race here is seen as influencing moral tendencies. If you're into a discussion about alignment and Dungeons and Dragons, this is where we can open that up. It also has the establishment of the exception to the race, right? The credit to the race, despite the otherness, despite the evil that is inherent in the other, and that's Dristo Erden from uh, R.A. Salvatore's famous novel set in The Forgotten Realms. So thinking about the theoretical framework and just looking at time, I know there's, there's a lot to unpack here, so uh, uh, I, I'm just going to go over these very briefly. I'm providing two critical vocabularies that I see as being absent here. The first is whiteness as a strategic rhetoric, which is developed by Thomas Nakayama and Robert Krizek in their landmark 1995 article. Um, the, the things that I can say about this is a really, really complex uh, uh, conversation. A strategic rhetoric, though, denotes the, the subject position of the dominant. So a strategic rhetoric from a dominant subject position, which might be a business, like Wizards of the Coast, would do things in order to maintain its dominance is sort of the idea. And whiteness as a strategic rhetoric references that particular dominant subject position. Additionally, I'm applying the idea of Frantz Fanon's human. And this is from Armand Towns and his work on uh, Fanonian discourse and on Fanonian rhetorical criticism. This is Sylvia Winter's man. This is Denise De Silva's uh, transparent eye. 
And what Armand points us to is that there are two productive modes of analysis. It's productive to think ourselves in terms of the theoretical, in terms of away from the self-other dialectic and comprehending racial violence as necessity for our self-constitution. It's also radical. So this is Fanon's tripling that points towards the new humans. So what conclusions am I ultimately coming to through this analysis of the controversy? The first conclusion that I'm coming to is that within the controversy itself, we have many different examples, including Mendes Hode's piece, where the decolonial is being induced, right? Where people are saying that the anti-colonial critique is necessary. However, what I add to that critique is that we need to move away from recognition. This is what Armand Towns gives us. So he said, uh, Mendez Hode says, every orc is a person the way that every human is a person. Towns leads me to reject this notion and other notions of representation that have been talked about here entirely. We ought not to be stri striving for recognition. Instead, we ought to move towards new human. This is the Fanonian tripling. We can talk much more about this again, but it's not to say that speculative fiction will save us. It's to realize our positionality as people of color, as women, as people are of historically excluded or oppressed, marginalized identities, right? Sexual orientation, whatever it might be, gender identity, etc. Those things, right, provide us with potentiality because ultimately we do not have access to the subject object dialectic. We exist in a realm of non-being outside of that dialectic. So the new human is not going to leave these things behind. The new human is not going to stop uh, uh, role-playing or stop having fantasy fiction or something like that, but we need to attend to that critical vocabulary that we have, and that's what my study aims to do. I know there's a lot of complexity here that's not able to be fully explored, so I just want to give my contact info as well. Uh, here's my email address. Please uh, uh, reach out if you want to interact with the study, if you want to get a copy of the slides or anything like that. And like I said, I'll be on the discourse later on. I really appreciate everybody's time, and I'm looking forward to a productive question and answer period. Thanks so much. Thank you. Cody and a round of a virtual applause, of course. Uh, I, I would like for for uh, the the applause to equal the amount of, of flurry that uh, went through the chat during that um, that particular presentation. We were very lively. I think the coffee has finally kicked in, so we're very <laughs> we're very very lively. And 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 also, this is a is an extremely sensitive and um, hot topic right now. So I'm I'm glad that it's being treated with such care. Um, our final panelist today is Eric Stein. Eric, can you activate your camera and get set up? Please? I'm here. Wonderful. I'm so excited because you're talking about stuff from my community. And in any case, um, or our, our community, as there's so many of us you know, here on, on the call today. So what I'd like to do is just introduce you and then you're welcome to present. Um, and, and, and Eric has also included his presentation um, in the Discord as well. Eric Stein, pronouns are he, him, is a game development instructor at Trinity Western University, a game studies researcher, and an independent game designer. He teaches courses as varied as interactive storytelling and project management, has conducted research on such games as Dark Souls and Kentucky Route Zero, and has completed two tabletop uh, role-playing games for Zine Quest and Kickstarter, Lost Scriptures, and Glitchspiel. His research can be found at Orchid ID and his games on itch.io. So take it away, Eric. Is Eric frozen? Is anyone else experiencing this? Yeah, I can't see him. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's let's see if we can rouse him. <laughs> yeah, it's true. We we now dub today glitch day, and and things just work on a different logic on glitch day. Um, or I'm hoping that that he's able to log out and log back in. Um, again, note on procedure, we will be um, doing the raise hands uh, procedure in the end, but it, you know, with the resolution of the glitches, we will have 15 minutes or even less than that for questions. So do try to keep your questions to be more of questions than comments. 
um, and 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 short. I disappeared. I think I'm back now, though. Yep, you're back now. I I I, I stalled by saying some words, and now you're back. And we're we're <laughs> happy that you you two are participating in the glitch day uh -huh. uh, exercise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure what happened there, but I'll, yeah. I'll try the share the screen share again, and uh, we'll see. We'll see if that works this yeah. time. Thank you so much. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. You can see PowerPoint. Everyone's faces aren't disappearing, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> so, as the introduction said, my name is Eric. Uh, I teach at Trinity Western University, and I also make tabletop role playing games on on the internet. Um, now, before we get going here, um, this presentation is not explicitly concerned with decolonization, uh, but as a settler Canadian living on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Stolo Nation, it is important that I acknowledge that emancipation, which is the core theoretical idea of this paper, is not first and foremost an intellectual idea for philosophical conversation, but a lived struggle to be practiced in everyday life, a struggle from which I am too often shielded by the privilege that society affords towards me. Uh, in my game design practice and my research, I am committed to this struggle, and the work that I'm presenting to you today flows from that commitment. Uh, and so I'm really excited to be on this really incredible panel with all these incredible thinkers and their ideas today to talk about uh, emancipation and tabletop role-playing games. So uh, the, title, the title of this presentation, uh, if we go back just a second, you might have seen in the, in the programming that it was originally subtitled Procedures for Emancipation in uh, tabletop role-playing game design, I decided to focus specifically on Dream Askew, Dream Apart, which I'm going to be talking about today, uh, thus the change, but otherwise the content remains unchanged. So three key questions that have framed my uh, design work over the last few years. Can a game itself be emancipatory? Is there a type of game or a set of mechanics that can bring about emancipation? And if so, how do we design for emancipation? So one of my first attempts at a response to these questions was a micro RPG that I called Advent and submitted to the 200 word RPG challenge in 2019. Uh, the core mechanic for this game I drew from Alain Badiou's Manifesto for Philosophy, which was published in 1989, and specifically using his concept of the truth procedure. A truth procedure is something that responds to an event. An event is a rupture in the current state of a situation. A rupture is an occurrence that does not yet have a name in the situation. And so the truth procedure shows that the event is true for the situation. And as a consequence, the terms of the situation are extended by the truth procedure. The, the truth appears as if it comes from the outside, but by the truth procedure, it's shown to have always been there. Um, through the work then of the truth procedure, subjects are constituted, um, subjects in the philosophical sense. Um, so, this is one of my first attempts at responding to those initial three questions. Um, and this idea from Hélène Badiou about subjectivity has uh, run through a lot of my work, including um, those two Kickstarter projects that were mentioned in my bio. Um, Hélène Badiou writes, a subject is nothing other than an active fidelity to the event of truth. This means that a subject is a militant of truth. And this concept of militancy uh, in relation to subjectivity and truth uh, is, is really essential to the, the kind of the ideas that I'm exploring in my work. Now, um, looking, at, uh, looking at militancy and, and these, this pr truth procedure, uh, when you talk about procedures in games, um, it's kind of a default to go to Ian Bogost's work um, and specifically his early works, Unit Operations and Persuasive Games. Uh, but one of the interesting things about these games, uh, about these, these texts, is that they rely heavily on Alain Badiou's philosophy and applying that philosophy to games. Um, Alain Badiou forms the, the key theoretical resource for these two early works. Um, but Bogost's application of these, uh, of, of Badiou's ideas, is, is kind, of, uh, kind of interesting. Um, Bogos concludes persuasive games with three purposes of persuasion um, that games, and specifically in his context, serious games can deploy. The first is assessment, which checks whether an event conforms with the situation. This is very Badusian. He's responding to um, the terms of the situation and, and confirming whether or not this event is, um, is acceptable. 
So this is, this is from the position of power assessment. Uh, deliberation foregrounds the terms of the situation, uh, but the result of deliberation can either be in support of the situation or against. There's no kind of concrete outcome. And then conversation is, is Bogost's most positive uh, use of persuasion, which is uh, emphasizing our role in the procedural elaboration of the situation, that we have we have agency to uh, choose how to deploy procedures and how to act in situation. Um, but Bogos' focus on, on rhetoric ultimately pushes politics to the side. It's not to say that rhetoric isn't important, um, but in Badiou's work, Badiou is primarily focused on this militant activism. Uh, his philosophy is ultimately for the purpose of a militant fidelity. And so this militancy is missing if we just talk about pers persuasion and games from this rhetorical standpoint. It's important that we talk about militancy. And specifically, it's important to talk about the, the points in discourse where rhetoric fails. And so uh, a contemporary of Alain Badiou, uh, Jacques Ranciere's work is really helpful on this point of understanding where uh, persuasion fails. Uh, so Ranciere writes in Descensus about his, his, this kind of key idea of his call that we call the census, which is not a confrontation between interests or opinions. It's not about a public sphere where we're having conversations and trying to uh, come to the correct decision, correct interest or opinion. Descensus is the demonstration or manifestation of a gap in the sensible itself. Descensus shows where something is missing from sensibility. Uh, this idea of sensibility Jacques Ranciere developed in an earlier work in the politics of aesthetics. I call the distribution of the sensible, the system of self-evident facts of sense perception that simultaneously discloses the existence of something in common and the delimitations that define the respective parts and positions within it. Um, for Ranciere, aesthetics is always political because aesthetics defines what can be seen and what cannot be seen. So it comes before any any point of conversation, any rhetorical position that we might take, because it's about defining sensibility itself. And so Ranciere and, and Badiou work in a very fruitful conversation with each other. Um, Ranciere's distribution of the sensible is roughly equivalent with, Bad, with Badiou's situation. For Ranciere, aesthetics can demonstrate gaps in the distribution of the sensible. And for Badiou, art is one of the generic procedures of truth, along with science, politics, and love. So art and politics are, are yoked in, in both of their work. For Ranciere, aesthetics is always political. For Badiou, truth is always militant. For both, art is always the site of a contest against authority, which Badiou terms the state. Um, if art is not a contest against authority, in Badiou's sense, it is not true. Um, so persuasion, therefore, does not take us far enough. It's not a debate about truth so much as a debate about showing what is not present. That, that's the real function of the event and of the truth procedure. Um, so this is... Uh, kind of the, the militant direction that we uh, are wanting to go. And so we can now ask the question, what about games? Uh, let's, let's turn to a case study. So Dream Askew, Dream Apart are two games, Dream Askew by Avery Alder and Dream Apart by Benjamin Rosenbaum, included in the same volume um, and released in 2018. Both games use the belonging outside belonging system, which was developed by Alder and Rosenbaum for the book. Belonging outside belonging is itself a power by the apocalypse system from Vincent and Maggie Baker, um, but it, it has spawned its own genre of games entirely, many of which diverge quite far from the, the, the PPTA roots of the, of the system. Uh, at present, there are 98 items tagged belonging outside belonging on itch.io. There's a thriving independent community of creators working on both small and large projects in the genre. And uh, the Plus One Forward podcast interviewed several belonging outside belonging creators last summer. So if you're interested in learning more about the genre and hearing uh, directly from the creators themselves, such as, such as Avery Alder, um, this podcast is a great place to start. Uh, you can just Google Plus One Forward, uh, or I can send you a link if you would like it. It's, it's excellent. Um, so Dream Askew, Dream Apart presents no, this idea of no dice, no masters, which is another name that's used for belonging outside belonging games coming from a note early in the book. If tabletop role-playing games constitute a referential universe or situation, in Bajio's words, this statement, no dice, no masters, is an indiscernible of the situation. This means, in other words, that it's a hypothetical signification. It signifies or it points toward something that's hypothetical that may be the case. Uh, no dice, no masters is a statement that might in fact be the case. It's therefore a statement that requires investigation. Importantly, this investigation occurs through play because this, this statement is in the context of a game. 
Aldrin Rosenbaum note that those with a long history of role-playing games might have some instincts that will lead them astray, uh, such as needing dice, needing a game master. But if players follow the procedures of the game, the rules, they will enact the truth procedure necessary to investigate the system. So we can ask these kind of sub-questions. Is it possible to play a tabletop game without dice and without a game master? And if so, what does this play accomplish? So let's look at the basics of play. In Dream Askew, Dream Apart, and Belonging Aside Belonging Systems in general, play is driven by the choices that players make rather than by the chance of the dice rolls. This play is not strictly competitive or cooperative, but rather is interested in exploring the drama that wells up between the main characters and all around them. Rather than having their action directed by a game master, players are encouraged to make authentic, interesting choices with the spirit of curiosity on, the, on their own. Furthermore, no game master means that no one has prepared a story in advance for the characters to play out. Play is a conversation, an exploration, and an experiment. So this is what it means to have a no dice, no masters game. These are the, the terms of the investigation, uh, the terms of this new situation or this new definition of the situation that we're going to follow. I apologize if this is a little small on the screen, but the action of the game, um, the action of the game is, is really interesting. And if we look at the, the text structurally, we see that the first two procedures of the play are concerned with comfort and safety. Um, Comfort begins with establishing a food plan with your friends, establishing a food plan, a plan for breaks, a plan, a, a, a plan for just taking time to rest and not, not overburden yourselves, not strain yourselves while, while playing. The subsequent page is uh, the safety procedure about developing uh, rules uh, or conditions for safety uh, among, your um, among your community of players at the table. Um, these processes are not separated from the procedures for character creation and world creation. I think this is so important. Um, comfort and safety are considered integral to and indeed primary to the overall procedure of play. They're not put in a separate section of the book. They're not separated from play itself. There's just a, a steady uh, continuity, but from comfort to world creation to uh, actually playing playing the game proper as we would understood it uh, in the way that the book is formally organized. Uh, I think this is really, really important for the game. Moving from here uh, and just moving right along to act, players utilize the move procedure. A move takes a prompt for an input and produces narrative action as an output. Here are some examples from Dream Askew if you're not familiar with the game. These are the moves. So uh, maybe to preface, imagine in imagine in D and D you encounter you know the the classic group of a classic group of enemies, some goblins, and you say, "I want to I want to hit this goblin with my sword. I want to cast magic missile. I want to X." Um, in Dream Askew, you don't have moves like this. Instead, you have moves like the following: stare into someone's eyes without blinking, cave to someone else's desires, share food or advice with someone. Offer someone a cigarette. Let someone see you at your most vulnerable. And in all of these, no dice are, are rolled. These moves are categorized in different ways. The, the, normal, the, the typical way is in weak and strong moves, but uh, many of creators have, have adjusted this for their own work in belonging outside belonging. Um, but the basics are if a player makes a weak move, demonstrating their vulnerability, oops, all right, folly or plain rotten luck, they get a token. A player may spend a token to make a strong move, demonstrating their skill, power, astute planning, or good luck. So what does this accomplish? In a dice and stat system, the risk of failure is overcome by leveling up. Chance is repressed, ultimately, and failure is ultimately repressed. And belonging as I belonging, the risk of failure is essential for play and never overcome. Because play is directed into storytelling and not leveling up, leaning into risk is procedurally encouraged. Risk makes for better stories. The core mechanic of a belonging as I belonging game procedurally challenges power and welcomes vulnerability. But this mechanic is also paired with a thematic focus on marginalized groups who've gathered together to build community, groups that stand in sharp relief to a larger, looming, dominant culture. Dream Askew explores the story of a queer enclave amid the collapse of civilization. And Dream Apart explores the story of a Jewish shtetl in a fantastical version of 19th century Eastern Europe. These groups do not belong to the state of the situation, but through the investigation of their existence in play, there is a retro action that demonstrates that their existence is true for the situation. Truth does not belong to the situation. It comes from outside. It's deemed illegal by the state. But through the truth procedure, the truth is shown to have always been a part of the situation. Understood in this way, truth necessarily demands emancipation from the state. It requires a revolution in the terms of the situation and a militant commitment to these new terms. 
So to our questions, can a game itself be emancipatory? Yes, I would say so. Is there a type of game or a set of mechanics that can bring about emancipation? Yes and no, this is a more complex question and we're out of time, so I won't delve into it, but my, we can talk, maybe talk about this in question and answer. There's more complexity in the results of these games, uh, of what a, an emancipatory game can produce. There, um, and yeah, maybe maybe I'll just leave it there. You could read the the rest of this. The rest of this is on Discord. Um, but I think these questions are essential to ask. Um, and I hope this uh, this talk has been productive for everybody here in attendance. There's the contact in the paper. Thank you for all of your time. Thank you, Eric. And a round of virtual applause for you. Throw up your applause emojis or um, or put it in the chat. And I've got uh, an immediate question from, from uh, Eliane Batachi, which is, uh, cool, can you name some? Which is, which is specifically, you know, you were, you, you were saying, um, uh, you know, what, what are some of these emancipatory um, moves and games that you can identify? Yeah, for sure. So specifically, um, kind of near the end of the present presentation, and you can find these on the second to the last page in the slides that I put on Discord, um, in the context of Dream Askew, Dream Apart, um, Dream Askew, what's really important in, in the core mechanic of Dream Askew is that it privileges vulnerability over power. So the mechanics actually encourage players to lean into being vulnerable rather than leaning into the power fantasy that's typically associated with uh, kind of traditional role-playing games. Uh, as well, Dream Askew doesn't have a progression mechanic in the in the way that we uh, we normally interpret with the level up mechanic, and so uh, success in the game, having a, a successful time at the table, is not equated with power and progress. Um, Dream Askew as well doesn't reproduce gameplay loops of domination and exploitation, and uh, what I talked about kind of more, a little bit more at length is this idea of the game fostering comfort and safety as an integral part of play rather than a, a, an afterthought or a separate that's separate from play. And so these are just some examples from from Dream Askew itself. Uh, and I think many games in the belonging outside belonging tradition uh, uh, do that sort of work. But uh, in the broader indie tabletop scene, I think we can talk about uh, and look look for examples of lots of different games that do do similar work in a similar sensibility. So maybe I'll leave it at that. Thanks for the question. Yeah, and and I've got I've got one um, early question uh, for Stephen, which is: uh, Do you have uh, key books on uh, socialization or the male preserve that you would like to recommend? So the um, major sociologist that wrote on the male preserve, uh, his name is Eric Dunning, and um, he wrote two books, and I can definitely put those into the uh, Discord, and he wrote a series of articles. I will admit some of the articles are very hard to find because they were written in the late 70s, early 80s, and as such, um, like one of them, I had to get it through interlibrary loan because I could not find a PDF of it because it is like being PDF before PDFs. But um, if you are interested in that article, you can just email me and I'll definitely send it to you. But um, I will put into the Discord um, like his three or four key pieces. Uh, one very important thing that he brings up, which actually factors into all of my discussion of, um, of this idea of gaming as a male preserve is hooliganism and what hooliganism looks like. And um, Toral, um, actually there is a piece in IG, IJRP, and that's the third time I've mentioned it, um, that actually speaks about the whole idea of hooliganism, which is, um, a, oh no, actually Toral's piece was in a, a Game and Culture. And um, I'll actually put that into the link too, because it's a great idea of looking at uh, Gamergate and the idea of online hooliganism. And I think that plays into the idea of the male preserve and gaming overall being a male preserve, even in tabletop games. Right, and I have a question from uh, Jonathan Lawrence, uh, which, which relates to playing or using some of these games for those uh, of, of, of us in the audience uh, coming from situations of privilege. Uh, for instance, the authors of Coyote and Crow have spe specifically invited 
uh, non-Indigenous uh, individuals to use it, but do you have any caveats or concerns for people wanting to use them um, and, and identify their own positionality as, you know, assists a uh, white um, male religious professor trying to, to still nevertheless introduce these issues in? And so this is actually a question for the panel. How then um, do, do the privileged um, sideline their privilege uh, and, and nevertheless engage with, with this kind of uh, a, a culture? And I mean, I have, a, I have an answer to this, but I'm going to leave it to the panelists. Um, anyone, anyone can respond um, or who wants to take it? I would love to hear from Kay and or Annie on this question. It seems like y'all's piece is particularly well situated if you have something. Agreed. I don't know, is Annie there? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my internet's being wonky. Um, I live on the reservation, so it's always glitch day here. Um, so I'm gonna leave my camera off. But I think this is a great question. And I think um, the, I mean, I think for me specifically and kind of this project specifically, the idea is, is that you kind of use it as a tool to understand like your own cultural teachings, which whatever those might be. Um, and you do it through a lens of indigenous teaching, but I think there's totally a way to do that without appropriating any of the cultural pieces of that. Um, and by bringing in your own experiences and your own, um, your own belief systems and your own values and things like that as a way of kind of processing and unlocking your own trauma and, and sifting through those trauma responses. So I know for me and Kate can jump in if she agrees or disagrees with this. It's really meant to be a very accessible and adaptable tool that's informed by indigenous knowledge, but isn't exclusive to indigenous people. Yeah, I just want to add to that. So me as the white person on this project, I, I know that for me and working in these spaces, um, it's been essential to have partnerships and build relationships with people in the community, like with Annie, so that, you know, I'm not just making assumptions and I have someone to center me and help, help me understand. So I think that that's, that's one of, you know, not going in just assuming I know everything and just being open to being wrong about everything has been my experience. And, and I, I think I'm going to echo something from Cody's talk about whiteness. Whiteness itself is just this privileged subject position. It actually has no content to it uh, that you, uh, you may identify as white or, or the society may call you white, but then there, there, you, you do have an ethnicity. You do come from somewhere. You do, you know, and, and that does have roots and exploring those roots and realizing what sort of traditions and practices that you hold uh, dear, um, either in accordance with or divergent from what you see as a dominant white culture, which is shifting all the time, will help, right? But but uh, what, one thing in, in Cody's presentation was that, you know, we also have this bedrock of bioessentialism of really, really toxic uh, ideology running through most culture that we interact with. So you're always in this constant act of trying to differentiate your own beliefs from those that are imposed on you or encouraged. If I can maybe just add a little, my two cents on the on the question, something that's been really valuable for me uh, has been um, like coming coming from my own uh, like privilege standpoint as a, a white settler Canadian, um, and just just as I like try to foreground as much as possible, um, like that affords that affords me privilege. Um, but reading S Stefano Harney and Fred Moten's work in in the Undercommons, which is freely available online, and like highly highly recommend it. Um, I was really struck reading that book uh, in this this invitation that they posed to people who occupy privileged standpoints like myself to acknowledge how um, like the sy the system of colonial capitalism that we live in isn't even good for white people. Um, 
it's not even good for, and we should maybe say the vast majority of white people. And yet there's this ideology or this false consciousness that um, runs through our culture, through our society. Um, we can maybe call it the, the American dream or we can, you know, whatever, whatever dreams of upward mobility, whatever we might, whatever we might talk about it. And, and they, they, specifically point out that these dreams are this is a, this is a false consciousness or an ideology that's used to um, keep everybody down and including white people uh, but white people there's this apportionment this apportionment of benefit that's give given to this privileged class to to effectively subdue them and so I was really uh, challenged by them to kind of step into this uh, position of, of accomplice of the position of the accomplice in kind of throwing off the 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 false consciousness that you know I was raised to just accept um, that I was kind of inducted into as as a child and to step into doing doing this work actively um, and so it's always acknowledging acknowledging my position acknowledging where I come from uh, just just as several folks have already said um, but acknowledging that like like my privilege is is bad for me. It's maybe good. It like it has produced maybe good effects in some ways. But like uh, Harney and Moten kind of step into this idea of like almost like it's almost like spiritually bad or it's bad for you like as a human in some way. Um, and like that's something that I need to throw off in the particularities of my, my own life, uh, just as much as emancipation is meet, needed more broadly for people who don't have the privilege that I have in my life. Um, and so stepping into that position of accomplice that Stefan Harney and Fred Moten put forward has been really important for me in my game design practice. Sorry, that's kind of rambly. I, I think also the uh, acts of initiation that have been mentioned here, uh, both in Stephen's talk as well as in, in uh, uh, Kate and Annie's talk are, are very key. Uh, Kate and Annie's talk often forced initiation through residential schools and um, and other coercive methods, specifically, you know, sort of in the genocide playbook, it's ongoing. Uh, and and Stephen, you know, talking about the, 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 this cultural capital that is immediately used as a barrier, um, you know, to 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 sanction certain forms of white male um, involvement with with gaming before before you can even get to the rules or whatever the game content might actually be about. So initiation, I think, is one thing I'm taking away from this panel as as being this this where we get into a, a kind of dark spiritual place. Um, I'm going to ask Alexander's next question, which is a question for Stephen. Uh, we had a keynote by Scott Nicholson on immersion from your own experience or stories you've heard. Did these external factors of gaming culture you talked about uh, impact your, your experience of in-game immersion? So thank you for the question, Alexander. It's a really good question. The moment you wrote it, I was just deeply thinking about it and positioning myself specifically not only as a black male gamer, but also positioning myself as a sociologist. And one thing that I came to realize that didn't, that wasn't, a, that I wasn't aware of until you asked that question is that immersion requires socialization. So in other words, if you don't feel like you belong in the space, you don't feel like you understand what's going on in the space, immersion and bleed are going to be that much more difficult. I'm not going to say they can't happen. And the fact is that your slow socialization could indeed be precipitated and, and actually uh, forced into locomotion by bleed or by immersion. But the simple fact is that if you don't understand what's going on, or you don't feel like people are letting you understand what's going on and you're slow to the table, immersion becomes a much more difficult process. I know it was for me that I felt like I had to go through multiple games before I felt like, not that I understood the mechanics of the game, because I felt like that I read the rule books before I even came to my first game that I understood the mechanics of the game, but the mechanics of the culture and I would think personally, it took me a long time to understand the mechanics of the culture to say, I feel like I belong here. And I think immersion doesn't happen until that point. And I think it's hard to reimagine the characters because I started playing D&D when all of the visual representations were white. It took me a while before I could 
envisioned something of that human was something other than white. And that's only because it took me a while to get to that point of immersion, of thinking of myself and the character as possibly the same person rather than sort of a, a convenient marker that would fulfill and check all of the boxes that the culture around me would have appreciated. So I honestly believe that there is something to be said that immersion is, it has to go hand in hand with a level of socialization. Thank you, Stephen, and also thank you for for all the panelists. Um, I'm I, I, I'm calling it eleven thirty because I like to keep strict time to keep our half hour of rest a sacrosanct. That means that everybody's um, uh, everybody's uh, further comments can be, can be directed towards the Discord, which has been put in the chat. So please do take the conversation there. I know that there was a lot of resources shared around Cody's talk as well. So please check out, I mean, it, it, there's just this, this wealth of, of, of discussion of, on this particular topic. Um, don't hesitate to tune in at noon uh, for uh, panel six, I believe it, it, it is, is what's happening at noon. Um, and uh, that's, that's a storytelling and role-playing game. So please do, uh, stick around in half hour. We are ready uh, to continue this wonderful conference. And thanks all to the presenters for, for enduring our glitch fest. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much.